Hi guys, welcome to episode seven of season five. This season is all about the simple steps to improving our health. Today we're talking about a topic that I don't think is talked about enough, but it is so important for our health that we have a healthy view and attitude towards food. And today I'm bringing on a very special guest, Amber Binge of Grace Walk Farm is coming on to talk about eating disorders and her personal lifelong battle with eating disorders. And she's giving us so much encouragement after she shares her story, which is, I won't lie, very sad. Um, she then uplifts us with really helpful, practical tips not only for someone who is recovering from an eating disorder, but also for all of us moms who have children, both male and female, teenager, younger, um, even older than teenager, who, you know, how we can look for any possible warning signs and what our reaction can be if we think there might be an unhealthy view of food, of food <laughs> with a member of our family. So, um, I guess I should tell you who Amber is. Amber is um, a writer, a gardener, a pastor's wife, and a homeschool mom. And I met her over on Instagram, and her and I have become really close friends. Um, she's a really fun connection to have made. So if you don't know Amber yet, go check out Grace Walk Farm and go check out her gardens. She has amazing gardens. They get bigger every year. They get fancier every year. And, you know, speaking of garden, before I bring Amber on, let me just remind you that if you want to make sure you have the best soil possible this year, I mean, you have to, if you want to have the best garden, like it all starts with the soil, definitely go over and check out the information at solelyrested.com slash soil, or just go grab a kit. Um, this soil kit, I can't recommend it enough. It changed my entire outlook on my garden and it kept me from killing my garden, seriously. And if you go to redmondagriculture.com and get one of those soil kits, make sure that you use the code solely rested, S O U L Y rested for 15% off. And you know what? You might even want to grab a couple, depending on how big your garden is, if you have more than one garden that you're testing, or I got to because I want to test again in the fall and I want to see how my spring soil compares to my fall soil because there's a lot of amendments I can do in the fall if any improvement is needed then. So go check it out, redmanagriculture.com, use code solely, S-O-U-L-Y, rested, or go to my website for more information my whole story with my soil testing and a lot of great tips for you at solelyrested.com slash soil, S-O-I-L. And now let's bring on Amber. I'm excited about this. So Amber, I am so glad that you could take some time today to talk with me. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, it's not necessarily a fun topic to talk about. So I was really, really thankful when you said you were willing to. Yeah. Um, well, I think when I first, I don't know, do you remember how we met? I know it was on Instagram. I think the first time we met, you actually shared with me that you were battling weight gain. And I think we were talking about kombucha related to weight loss. Yes. Am I, I right? Was, I was right smack dab in the middle of my health journey. And yes, I had talked to you about, I had a really bad soda addiction. That's right. <laughs> And so you gave me some help with the kombucha and kind of gave me some alternative ideas and it really, really helped it fun. Oh, good. It's a really nice alternative to, to soda for sure. Yes. Um, so, and then I remember later on, after I had known you for a little while, you shared with me that you actually had struggled with an eating disorder as a young girl yes. and how that has a big impact on how you approach any kind of a weight plan or a weight loss plan at this stage in life, you know? Mm -hmm. So instantly when you started sharing with me about that, I thought I would love to have you on this season on the podcast because it fits in so perfectly with what we've been talking about here. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, Thank you. I hope my story can maybe encourage someone else or help a mama with a daughter who might be struggling or exactly bring a little hope. That's what I'm as a mom of four girls. That was the first thing I thought of when you said you were available. I thought, oh, you know, even if the listeners never struggle with this battle, they probably have a daughter who at some point might possibly struggle with this battle. So I think it's very pertinent to everybody. And in fact, I was looking on the National Eating Disorder Association's website on some research that they have done and that they share. And apparently 13% of the girls in the nation suffer from some sort of an eating disorder by the age of 20. That I was kind of surprised. That's that's a large, that's a lot of girls, you know? And you know, there's probably even more that that are unreported because most people never tell a soul when they're struggling with this. So it's probably really much higher than that even. I agree with you for sure. That makes perfect sense. Um, And they went on to say that young people who had any sort of an eating disorder are actually 10 times at risk for dying at a young age as any of their peers. And I thought, wow. Now they didn't go on to explain, but to me, that signals they're dying from possibly something related to their eating disorder. Sure. And that that's that's just... It's heartbreaking. Yeah, so, it's terrifying as a mom, really. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And you have such a great perspective as a mom because you've literally been there, been in the trenches. Could you share your story with us? Just give us some insight. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, really, I don't even know that I could pinpoint an age when it started for me. Um, I grew up in a home where eating was really disordered for everyone. Mm. Um, my parents were in love with yo-yo dieting. Um, Mm. There was always a new diet, a new exercise machine, a new gym membership, something. You know, that Uh, was like all of, like all of the eighties, wasn't it? Like I'm thinking like the Jane Fonda, what do you call the leg warmer? (laughs) You know, like all of that. I think everybody was into crazy weird diets. Yeah. And I think, you know, my parents were wonderful, loving parents. You know, I, I was really blessed to have good parents but they didn't realize the impact that their obsession with weight loss was having on me as a little girl Mm. who was already just very self-conscious. And it really was the perfect storm created because when I was very, very young, um, my mother actually went and sought treatment for an eating disorder. Mm. Um, And I have some very early memories of visiting her um, while she was there and Um, And it impacted me just because she had been my primary caregiver. My dad was a pastor. And so he was very busy and gone a lot. And so I had been with her, you know, 24 hours a day. And then suddenly I was, I guess, almost four when this happened. Mm. Suddenly she was gone for weeks. And And that's just old enough for you to actually remember it some still today. Yeah. And, yeah. and so right after that, um, literally in this, in the same period of a few months while she had been gone, um, and this happened before she left, but it was all around the same time. Um, a family friend was babysitting and I was abused oh. and food was given to me immediately after a little plate of cookies, like oh. here this will make you feel better. And so, um, really it was sort of cemented into my brain at that point that food is comfort, that even when everything around me is bad, I can control Mm. this little bit of food on my plate and find some sort of good feeling from it. And like most eating disordered, it it, it was rooted in trauma. Most eating disorders are. Um, And so, you know, that was at four years old. And it just kind of set me on a a path for that. Um, And then moving forward, you know, I, by the time I was 10, I was convinced that I was fat. Um, I played basketball and I can remember comparing myself to the other little girls, how big my legs were, how big my arms Mm. were, or, you know, could I run as fast? And if I wasn't the best, it was because I was fat. Mm. That was how. I understood it in my mind. Now, looking back, I can see that wasn't the case at all. I look sure, at I'm sure you look at pictures and you can remember your thoughts then, you know, like even yes. when the picture was taken and you're looking at it and thinking, Amber, you're gorgeous, you're thin, what's wrong? Yes. You know, like you want to hug yourself and shake yourself. And uh, yeah. I was yeah. just a normal little girl, but in my mind, 
I was not in my mind. I was like terribly overweight and people didn't like me because of it. And I thought people watched everything I ate and were silently judging me. And Mm. none of it was true. It was all lies, but they became my reality. It's kind of like you put on sunglasses when you have an eating disorder, you see everything through the tint of that. Mm. Um, And so even a well-intentioned, you know, comment from a parent or um, from a friend, it can be spun in a really negative direction really quickly. You know, is the hardest. I'm just sitting here thinking that I, I never had like a negative quote unquote or horrible, I should say self-image. I I would never had like this positive one growing up. I don't think any teen girls do. Right. But, (laughs) but for me at a, at a younger age, probably around five or six, I was really, really tall compared to everybody Mm -hmm. else. And I remember my one class that I was in was all boys. And you know, they're like how many years behind with their development. And so I I was tall anyway, and I towered over them. And I remember just feeling awkwardly tall, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it wasn't thankfully for me, like that wasn't something society said, it's bad for girls to be tall, you know, right. Our society was in this phase back in the eighties. Like I said, that girls had to be super, super twig. I mean, they were still thinking of Twiggy, I think at that point, was that her name? Twiggy? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I guess what I'm wondering is, does it also come down sometimes to something that makes us like, if we can encourage our children that it's actually good to be different. And it's okay, Mm -hmm. Michelle, it's okay that you're way taller than everybody else. There's like really good qualities to that. Or Amber, you are not an, you are an ideal weight. You are not fat, but you know what? There's great things that you aren't like those other people. And you know what I'm trying to say? Like, I don't don't know how to, I wouldn't say you should say negative things about the other kids in their class, but some way to make your own child just realize it's totally okay that you don't fit any cookie cutter mold. Like, You know, yeah, our kids need to hear that. You know, yeah. I needed to hear your legs are bigger because you have bigger muscles. Because Good you're point. Playing yeah. basketball, you See, know? That's or- exactly what I was trying to get at, but you're much smarter than I am. Yes, that's a perfect <laughs> thing. You're a basketball player. Those girls aren't. Of course, your legs are going to look different. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was just a lot of that kind of thing. Um, I actually joined Weight Watchers for the first time around 11 years old. Oh my it's goodness. Thinking back, I don't How did know. that happen? Like, did you, was it your idea? <laughs> well, my mom was going. Um, and so I started out just going with her because she didn't have a babysitter. And so I was sitting in the meetings and I was listening um, and, um, I'm a very like sensitive, empathetic person in general. Mm-hmm. And so I began to like feel their stories and it kind of interwove with the stuff already happening in my little heart at the time. And Mm. I became convinced this is, this is my answer. And so I asked my mom, I was like, can I sign up? Mm. And she was like, yeah, we'll, we'll be workout buddies, you know? And for her, I think she really was trying to encourage me to make healthier choices. Yeah. Um, But what I took from it was you need to do this because you've got a lot of weight to lose. Yeah. And um, so it kind of just set me up on a rotten path. And Mm. then um, our our nutrition was pretty lacking. Um, Typical 80 family, um, but working parents, uh, very busy. And we ate nothing but processed foods. Yeah. There was no garden. There was no farmer's market. Um, It just wasn't even on our radar. I mean, it was, it, my mom cooked, but it was all processed food products. Yes. You know? And um, so I didn't really even grow up understanding the concept of real food versus fake food. Yes. How drastically they can impact the body. Yeah. So, and you are not alone in this for sure. I think yes. that's something so many people are still working through today. I mean, that's why yeah. people are following you and me on Instagram. I think that's a huge reason why, because I, I was, it's what we talked about all season three here on the podcast. The entire mm-hmm. season was about processed food versus convenient food and the lie that we yeah. are being told daily still, you yeah. know, that we're trying to weed through the lies that we don't need processed food. It's not necessarily more convenient. It doesn't necessarily make our life easier, but my parents like yours mm-hmm. were on the same path, the exact same path because it was so appealing yeah. and we didn't, we didn't know 
what was happening science-wise to all of us mm -hmm. because of that processed food. Yeah, yeah, I think people just trusted, you know, this is low cholesterol or, you know, the fat-free craze was going on back then. Yep, yep, um, exactly. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah, it just, it just escalated and kind of continued. And so what about high school? High school's so hard anyway. How did yeah. you fare through that? It was rough. Oh. So in high school, um, I did some cheerleading, which drastically amplified my body oh. image issues because I was one of the larger girls on the squad. Um, and you, you always know, had to be the bottom of the pyramid. Yes, right? I was one of the tall series. <laughs> I was tallest. always the bottom of the pyramid. I was the cheerleader. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, and I have this memory um, of being fitted for cheerleading uniforms and they were measuring everybody to order the uniforms. And I remember sitting against the wall in that classroom and memorizing the measurements of every girl on the wow. squad. And then when I got mine done, I was comparing. I'm bigger than this one. Mm. I'm smaller than that one. I look, you know, my hips are bigger mm. than her. Um, and wow. so by the time I, well, I went on some crazy diets in high school. I'll mm. mention that. Um, probably the craziest thing I ever did is I ate nothing but Cheerios and oranges for about six weeks. Oh my goodness, Amber. Where did you get such an idea? I don't even remember where I came oh, from. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but I did. And I think back, like <sighs> I would take it to school. That was my lunch. I wouldn't eat breakfast for lunch. I would eat like maybe half a cup of Cheerios and an orange. Oh. And then you know, for dinner, I would make an excuse for why I wasn't going to eat. I was I just going to ask if your parents were okay with this. So they didn't know. No, they had no idea. We were, we were such a busy family in lots of different directions. By the time I was in high school, um, meals were kind of just catching on the fly and everybody do their own thing. So mm -hmm. I didn't really have any accountability. Um, I did what I wanted to. Yeah. And so I was able to hide it. I did it for, for weeks until I started to really feel terrible and of as course. a side note <laughs> yeah as a side note I didn't know then that I had celiac disease I cannot digest gluten oh. and so the Cheerios at that time were not gluten free oh my goodness <laughs> and so I was creating a storm in my body oh. uh, by doing that but um that's just kind of an example of the way my brain operated I was very extreme with it Mm. Um, and I was never all that thin because I would go to an extreme like that and crash diet, but then I would binge and gain it all back. Mm. And it became this vicious cycle. Um, by the time I was in college, I was starting to um, secretly binge and purge and I was abusing laxatives on a regular mm. basis. And um, so it wasn't until I was 19 and I was engaged to my husband we took a beginner psychology class together and, you know, in college, you take that psych 101 and you can suddenly like, you're, you're going to diagnose everybody in your oh, life. Oh, of course. You know, all the need to know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when, when we covered the eating disorder section, uh, my husband now, um, he pulled me aside after class that day and he was like, listen, I think you have an eating disorder. And I got really defensive and didn't want to listen. And now at that point, did you, did you know that you had an eating disorder? Yeah. Okay. I think deep down I did. Okay. Um, it was something. And the weird thing is looking back, I had uh, several very close friends that struggled with eating disorders oh. that were anorexia, kind of the other mm -hmm. end of the spectrum, so to speak. But right. um, like I would, I would be like Miss Therapist and try to help my friends. And I even put one in my car and drove her to my hometown from college to take her to counseling. Wow. And the whole time I'm completely wearing blinders to what wow. was going on in my own life. Wow. Um, so it wasn't until Josh called it out for what it was. That was the first time anyone had spoken truth to me about food and about the way I was living and what I was doing to my body. Um, and it was deeply impactful. Um, I, start, I started to seek out some help and um, really work on myself. And um, that's really when healing began for me with food. Um, I still struggled with weight, but um, 
my relationship with food changed mm-hmm. and I haven't gone back to the binging and purging and laxatives or any of that ever since. Like, um, I, I say I'm in recovery from an eating disorder. I don't think you ever get rid of an eating disorder, Mm. but you can walk in recovery, Mm. Uh, but it's an active walk. And my default is still the old disordered thinking. Those Mm. old childhood ways, they're still like my my ingrained impulse. So I, even now at 40 years old, I still have to catch myself at times with the things I'm thinking or the, the way I'm looking at food and say, wait a minute, you know, what is truth? What is the lie? And I have to really tease that apart sometimes to yeah. keep myself on track. I'm sure that's extremely important. Mm-hmm. And I mean, all of us can relate to that in some way because all of us have something I know I do all, every day that I'm looking at the wrong way. And I have to remind mm-hmm. myself that's not the way I need to look at this. So yeah. It's so great that you have the knowledge and the intuitiveness to be able to do that though and to fight that battle. I really have never thought about that, that it really is an ongoing lifetime battle once you've struggled with a really negative view of food. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, I want to pause this episode to tell you that I've already recorded next episode. And in the outtakes, when I was talking with our guest, we got to talking about kombucha and- I realized, you know what, just because I can, I want to extend my sale on my kombucha course. It was supposed to end in the end of May, but like I said, talking with this guest and how on fire she was about how much she had loved my course and how she loves making kombucha. I just thought, you know what, I'm going to extend it. So for one more month through the end of June, you can grab my masterclass, go to solelyrested.com slash kombucha. And seriously, snag this at less than half off the regular price. Starting July 1st, I'm not going to change my mind again. (laughs) I'm not going to extend it anymore. Starting July 1st, it's going to go back to the regular price. So if you are somebody that's out there buying kombucha, trust me, you absolutely need to learn how to make it yourself because it is so much more delicious. I have never purchased a bottle of kombucha that I liked as much as I can make kombucha. It is so much better when you're in control of the flavor, when you're in control of the fermentation. And all you need to know is really some simple tips and tricks. And I have it all lined out for you in the 12 modules of my masterclass. And this stuff is like life-changing. First of all, it is the most fun I have in my kitchen. And that says a lot because there's a lot of things I get pretty excited about in the kitchen. But making flavors and bottling kombucha and then pouring out a glass of it every day, it makes me happy. You guys, if you're not making kombucha, seriously, check out this masterclass, solelyrested.com slash kombucha. I will hold your hand, join me in my kitchen. We will make some bubbly fermented tea that you will quickly become addicted to. And that's okay because it is good for you. It is good for your gut health. It is loaded with beneficial bacteria and it's what your gut needs for maximum health. I mean, that's what this whole season is about. Simple steps towards improving your health. This simple step of drinking a glass of your homemade kombucha every day, it is going to improve your gut health and it's going to make you happier. It just is. That's the way it works. Kombucha, it's happy. So go to solelyrested.com slash kombucha before the end of the month, because then the sale is officially over, but grab it at less than half price, solelyrested.com slash kombucha, K-O-M-B-U-C-H-A. Go check it out. Looking back, like you mentioned that your parents had no idea you were doing the Cheerios and oranges thing. (laughs) Like if you as a parent had a child or a friend of yours had a child that was showing warning signs, like what, what would those warning signs be? What, what can a parent be looking for? How can they avoid the child sneaking the Cheerios and oranges like you were? Yeah, it's hard to spot really, because usually somebody who's struggling with this is going to be an expert at hiding. Mm. Um, But things you can look for are, number one, family mealtime is so important. Yes. Where you have your meals together, even if it's just dinner, um, making sure that your that your kid is eating and yeah. eating something good for them and something nutritional. Um, that's big. And, and just watch your kids, like be aware, what are their eating habits? And when you notice something change, um, 
be gentle about it, mm -hmm. but don't be afraid to confront the issue. Mm. Don't be afraid that you're going to upset the child and make it worse. It will make it worse 100% if you sweep it under the rug and pretend it's mm. not happening. And um, I think, you know, eating disorders are a little bit different than addiction, like a drug addiction, but the core of it is the same. Yeah. And any sort of thing like that thrives in secrecy. Yeah. And so when you remove the veil of secrecy and you bring it into the light and you make, make them where I see it, I see you, I love you and I want to make sure you're okay. Mm. Then you can kind of start an open conversation um, that can help, help your child before it becomes an issue. Um, you know, I have a daughter who she just turned 18 and I know she just graduated, right? Yes. 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 I can't believe it. <laughs> so exciting. Congratulations to you, by the way, you've homeschooled yes. since they were very young, right? Yeah. Since she started first grade, first grade. Okay. So it's such a big accomplishment. Congratulations to you. Cause I remember how very exciting that was for me. It's like, Oh my goodness. I, I succeeded, I think, you know? Yes, it's like crossing a big finish line after yes. decades. <laughs> yes, yes. So I interrupted you. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, but yes, yeah, she just turned 18. And I remember literally the day she was born, um, holding her and looking at her and thinking, how do I not mess her up? <laughs> mm. Because my, my, I knew, I was very aware that I still had a lot of work to do. She, I was uh, 22 when she was born. So you were literally uh, thinking about how can I not mess her up food wise? Yes. Wow. At birth. Wow. <laughs> I was worried about it. Um, and I prayed about it a lot. And mm. um, I, one thing I have been very fierce about um, with extended family is we don't do comments about weight. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't talk about, um, how a child looks. We don't talk about their size. Um, it should not be a thing. And so yeah, I agree. Now, what about, can I stop you there? What about yeah. food? Do you have any way that you regulate that? Do you have any family members that are like, Oh, you still have food on your plate. You got to finish that up or you're not eating enough. Or, you know, they're just always, cause I had some of those relatives with my mm -hmm. four girls that were always talking about food. And I just felt it was almost too much focus on food. Yeah, there, there's been some of that, um, but more more so family members that are still on a very processed food diet. Okay. And there's a lot of food fear still with a lot of my family. They're terrified of things like butter. Oh, yeah. Coconut oil. And they would fat. die if they knew I only use lard for my cooking fat, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. And like, so when I learned that there's a lot of health in those things when used properly and in the right proportion. Yeah. Um, I started to, to use those things and that created a little bit of an issue. There were some concerns raised to me about okay. that we were using butter instead of margarine <laughs> and those sorts of things. Um, even still, like it can be a little oh. delicate at family gatherings because I might bring a whole plate of something homegrown, home cooked. Yeah. First question I'll get is, is there butter in that? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. I'm like, yes, the answer is always <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, and it's funny, you know, people that are just like following your Instagram page, like it never crosses their mind that you have a relative that refuses to eat anything other than margarine. <laughs> yes, definitely. That's yeah, funny. I'm I'm definitely um sort of out of step with with a lot of my family and the yeah. way I like help and even you know, I, I lean towards alternative medicine and herbalism and just because yeah. I've seen the fruits of that in my own life. And so um, I get a lot of skepticism about that um, yeah. and being gluten-free, like both of my children have celiac as well. Oh, and when we found that out, making that transition to gluten-free was really hard because we would have family members that, that just didn't believe it was real. And they would, they would try to give my kids food and they would, I even had someone lie to me one time and say, this is, you know, I checked the ingredients and, and my kids got really sick from it. Oh. And so there was some broken trust there. Um, but even in all of those things, you know, I'm mindful, you know, we don't eat gluten, but we don't eat gluten because of weight. It's because it makes us yeah. sick. Right. You know? And so food choices aren't determined by weight. And um, yeah. that's been important for, for me as a mom. Yeah. Um, I know you also have a son and I feel like it's worth noting that 
because I know most people, myself included, always think of girls when you think of eating disorders. And um, do you have any tips for moms with boys? Because I know it is, you know, on the same website where I got the other statistic, they told me that males represent 25% of the people in our nation that currently have anorexia. 25% yeah. are males. Like, what? <laughs> um, and they're at higher risk of dying from an eating disorder because the website was explaining in general, people just don't think it's possible for a boy to have one. So it totally goes undiagnosed and they miss it. So I don't know, is there anything you can enlighten us about that? Yeah. I mean, I definitely will say having a boy and a girl, I've seen them both kind of go through spells where they struggle with body image. And, yeah, you know, I think boys, get overlooked because we just assume that they don't care because they don't talk about their feelings a lot that's a good and, point yeah yeah they're not as likely to maybe show outward signs when they struggle um so for my son he has he has struggled a little bit with being small um yeah. walker was born two months early and he's always been a little small and um very thin and now he is into martial arts he's training towards his black belt and all of that exercise he does he burns so many calories yeah like the poor kid just can't hold on to weight yeah and, um, so he gets comments on the other end of the spectrum mm -hmm. and that's what we've been dealing with, with most recently is people saying he's too thin you're not feeding him enough or the right mm -hmm. things and um, and I know that that bothers him. So that's where my current of mom share energies are directed. <laughs> of course. Uh, you know, again, it comes back to what we said in the beginning. Like our kids need to be absolutely assured mm -hmm. that it's not only okay, but it's actually good to be different in, in a good way, in the right way. Yeah. And again, you don't want to be the cookie cutter. You don't... Be, like poor Amber wanting all of her dimensions to equal the perfect girl on the cheerleading squad. No, that's not what we want our kids to strive for. Yeah. Um, I think you used the term make peace at some point. You said that you've come to make peace with, with mm -hmm. food. Like, can you give us any tips as we kind of wrap up here? Like just really practical tips. How can we be you know, at peace with food? Mm -hmm. I think knowing your food is kind of the first step, really understanding how it impacts your body, what foods make you feel good, what foods make you feel sick, you know, what what gives you energy versus what gives you that kind of like, I need to unbutton my pants, I'm in a food coma kind of experience. <laughs> Not a good feeling. No. Um, and it's just learning to listen to your body. Really, that's the core of this is learning to love yourself and listen to yourself. Yeah. Um, and here's the thing. All of us as moms can probably understand that mama bear call to protect our kids from this and to try to let them know, of course, our children are perfect and precious and their bodies are exactly as they should be. Of course, as moms, we see that. But what if we turn that around on ourselves? are we okay with how we look? Yeah. Like, is it okay how I am today? And it's hard to make peace with that. But for me, learning my food and growing my food has been yeah. a huge part of that. Huge Your gardens are amazing this year. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. yeah it's, it's getting me closer to the process of growing the food has been completely transformative for me. I eat so much more fresh, raw, and, yes. um, you know, and those things affect the way you feel. And the craziest part is all those years that I spent worrying about how much I weighed and playing this yo-yo game of bouncing up and down and up and down. Yeah. And since 2020, when we moved here and started homesteading and gardening, I've lost 70 pounds and mm. I have not dieted once. Yeah. It is purely the fruit of eating fresh food, yes. eating my body in the garden every day and just reconnecting to nutrition. And yes. that's, that's all it took. I've not been on a diet and I, I don't, honestly, I don't even get on a scale very often about once yeah. a month. It's a big yeah. trigger for me. We don't, we don't do that. Yeah. Um, and that's something I will throw into. I'm going to circle back things that parents can be aware of. Yeah. Don't, don't have a scale that's accessible to your children. Mm. Um, that was a big part for me um, was having access to a scale in the bathroom. I would weigh myself eight to 10 times a day at 10 years old. Wow. Um, so just remove the scale. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. What matters is how you feel. 
Mm. and how your body's functioning. So just, just toss that thing out. You don't need it. <laughs> I love it. That's a great point. I think so many bathrooms in America have a scale in them and yes. it's, you're right, not needed. And again, it's that subliminal message that we're giving to the kid. Yeah. You know? That, it, that it's important and it has to be there in the center of the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the example that we measure our own value based on a number on the scale. Yes. Our worth is not tied to that number. I'm not a better person today because the scale is one pound lower than yesterday. You know, I, that makes no difference. And your body changes. That's the thing. You, you, as a person who has obsessed over weight for many years, I can tell you, you can eat all the right things and do all the right things and still gain some weight because you're retaining fluid or something. Yeah. And then I'm not going to tell you this, but I am going to tell you this. Just give it a few more years and you start the menopause thing. And then it's insane. I'm not kidding. Some days you look at the French fry and somehow you gain a pound. I don't know. (laughs) Actually, I relate to that. I had to have a hysterectomy when I was 24. So so you totally relate to it. So yes. you battle the higher cortisol levels yes. and all of the craziness. Wow. Yeah. So that wow. was, that's tough. You know, when you, when you've come from an eating disorder and then, you know, I was just a few years out of kind of the thick of that. And then I was thrown into menopause in my mid twenties. Wow. Wow. Um, you know, it's been a roller coaster. I want to give so many stages of Amber a big hug. I just really <laughs> want to. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Um, oh, well, Amber, thank you so much. I mean, this is a lot for you to like open up about all this. And I am a hundred percent certain that some listeners were really blessed by it. And I know that it's been encouraging to me. And I'm just really grateful that you were willing to talk about all this with us today. Well, thank you for having me and letting me share my story and and Absolutely. just parents keep doing the good work. Keep yes, keep telling your kids how beautiful and valuable they are. And um, Amen, for sure. So, where can people find you, Amber? Um, the best place to connect with me is at gracewalkfarm.org. dot org. Okay, um, and from there you can get to. We have a YouTube channel and. Um, uh, we have an Instagram page where we post lots of gardening and canning things and tips yes. for that. Um, but yes. yeah, gracewalkfarm.org will get you connected. Awesome. Well, very good. Well, thanks so much, Amber. All right. Thank you. So there you have it, guys. I hope that you found that as encouraging as I did. I knew if there was somebody who could bring a positive light to such a difficult topic and offer some really helpful insights, I knew it would be Amber. So I hope that was helpful. Thanks for joining me. I hope that you join me again next Monday morning for our next episode in this series. I have more great, encouraging guests coming on. And by the way, if you have insights into this topic, if it's of something you've battled yourself or you're the parent of someone who's battled an eating disorder, I would love to hear from you. If you want to reach out over on Instagram and share any tips or encouragement that you have, um, and if you're okay with me sharing it, I would love to share it with my followers over there. It's solely.rested over on Instagram. So thanks for listening. Be sure to go check out that soil test kit. If you grow any food, this is the time to test that soil. And also, you know what I am wearing, if you're watching on YouTube, I am wearing some of my swag. If you haven't checked it out, we have a whole line of swag, shirts and bags, and even um, mugs, cups that every purchase supports our farm and our, our sugar bush and our efforts to encourage people and educate them in simple living and real food and the goodness in it. So if you want to go check it out, Um, My shirt says solely rested on the front and on the back, it has my motto slash verse that started the whole solely rested brand almost a decade ago, man. Oh, and right here, I just happen to have a beach bag. I love these. I just got these in. We just added them to our line. They have this rope handle. They're durable material, great for summertime. And there's a couple different designs. This one says simple doesn't mean easy. And on the back, it has our outtake right there, which I will leave you with right now. If you want to go check out all of the swag, go to solelyrested.com slash gear, G-E-A-R, solelyrested.com slash 
gear, and I bet you will find a shirt or some of their really cool stuff that you really like. And I would absolutely love to see, um, to send you some really great merchandise from our farm. So go check it out. Solelyrested.com slash gear, G-E-A-R. So that's it. Remember guys, it is easy to forget how blessed we are to live this life. So enjoy the simple everyday efforts. It's not easy, but it is definitely a good life.